Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Jeremy Osborne from the IIRC. I'm the Director of Business and Stakeholder Engagement, uh, and I will be uh, your Master of Ceremonies uh, for this afternoon's public webinar uh, on the International Integrated Reporting Framework uh, Revision. I'm delighted that we have Lisa French, our Chief Technical Officer um, from the IIRC, who's been leading this process for the revision of the framework. Uh, and we're very pleased that you've been able to join us today. So if we could move on, please, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so we've got a fairly uh, simple agenda. There are four areas we'd like to cover. Um, the first, we're going to look at the development of the integrated reporting framework over time. The second uh, uh, agenda items will walk through the timeline and the process to revise the integrated reporting framework. We'll then review the IIRC's 30-day focused engagement period, which concluded in March. And then using topic paper two as an example, we'll walk through how the results of the focused engagement have fed through um, to the consultation draft. Now, unfortunately, we won't have time today to go through all of the consultation questions in detail, but we will have time as a group to consider the actual consultation questions posed related to business model um, considerations. And as we go through uh, the webinar slides, there we will pause periodically uh, for Q&A. Um, I suggest, uh, if this is okay, that you write your questions in the chat function uh, of Zoom, uh, and you can send that privately to uh, myself if you want, or if you'd rather send them publicly, uh, then please copy everyone in. Uh, and uh, we'll pause periodically and we'll try and address the questions and respond to them as best we can uh, as, we, as we go along. So we move on one more slide. Thank you. Uh, then uh, uh, the IRRC, as I'm sure you are all familiar uh, with, is a global coalition of regulators, investors, companies, standard setters, the accounting profession, academia uh, and NGOs. And together, this coalition shares the view that communication about value creation should be the next step in the evolution of corporate reporting. And as I'm sure you're all very familiar with, the international IR framework was developed to meet this need um, and provide a foundation for the future. So I'm going to hand over now uh, to Lisa. And uh, when we come back to questions, uh, I'll help uh, make sure that all of those uh, are raised uh, and Lisa uh, will do her best to respond to them. So Lisa, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and thank you to those on the line. Uh, I recognize these are busy, busy times. Uh, so thank you very much for your continued interest and engagement in the IRC and integrated reporting. Okay, so as promised, we're gonna walk through quite, quite a bit of material here today. Um, since the IRC formed 10 years ago, it has basically maintained what we'll call a market-led approach. Um, and we can see that reflected in the framework's evolution. So in 2011, we co-developed the case for integrated reporting uh, through an open discussion paper. We then released a working draft of the framework or a prototype in November 2012. We then followed this up with an April 2013 consultation draft, which received public exposure for 90 days. And then this ultimately led to the final framework, which was published in December 2013. But we didn't stop there. So in 2017, we checked in with the market once again to see if there were particular challenges in terms of implementing the framework. Uh, and this attracted some 400 contributions, which reinforced that the framework and its principles-based approach continued to stand the test of time. So fast forward to, to today, and the principles on which the framework were founded are still as relevant as when the IRC formed. Notwithstanding that, that, uh, that point, our council agreed that it was high time to re-engage the market and to refresh the framework to ensure its continued relevance. So this slide ends with our commitment to launch a revised version of the framework by the end of this year. So let's take a quick look at the current revision process. So the timeline for the 2020 framework revision is shown here. So we launched the project on February 20th and basically dove headfirst into 30 days of focused engagement. 
And as part of that process, we released three topic papers which explored specific themes. And we'll get into these as we go along today. Uh, some of you on the line may have, uh, in fact, contributed to uh, the, the survey on, on these topic papers. Um, but suffice it to say, feedback from the focused engagement informed our consultation draft, which launched, um, if my math is right, six days ago. So just under a week, uh, just under a week ago. And, and this will remain open for public comment until, um, uh, until uh, August, uh, sorry, I flipped a page here, uh, until August 19th. So looking to the fourth circle, we'll, we'll analyze um, market feedback. Um, amend the framework as needed, and document the rationale for all changes. We'll do all of that between August um, and October. And finally, we'll seek endorsement and approval from our uh, council and our board in November in time for year-end launch of the revised framework. Now, I should point out that um, we're not going for a wholesale revision here, um, in large part because that would be disruptive to those who are already using the framework, already applying it. Uh, but we're just taking this opportunity to address a few recurrent issues, um, to clarify some concepts, and to ensure that the framework continues to be fit for purpose. Um, we'll also take this opportunity to probe a few key strategic considerations that lie um, outside the framework itself. So, what we promised a Q&A period, <laughs> let's have it now. <laughs> so, so I, I think just, just in terms of setting the context, so I've outlined some of the, the context and some um, process-oriented um, information. Um, are there any questions at this early stage? Um, if not, I'm happy for us to, to move on and to get into some of the other content, but I will pause there for a moment. Lisa, there's none as yet have come in uh, on the chat function. Um, okay. But if anybody would like to raise a question, um, please do so. I think you can also raise your hand virtually. Uh, and um, at least if you want to proceed, we'll, we can address those questions when we come to the next report. Perfect. And, um, you know, just because I'm marching on here, should anyone have any questions uh, on, on the process itself, please feel free to, to raise, uh, the, well, raise it in the chat function, as Jeremy said. Okay. So, oh, here we go. There is a question. So we have a question. Has <laughs> integrated reporting delivered on what it was originally trying to do? Okay. Well, that's a, that's a big question out, out of the gate. Um, I would say that um, it's a mixed answer. Uh, those who are applying the framework along with the spirit and intent um, of the framework and are following the requirements and evolving the reporting year over year, yes, they are making some great connections uh, between, for example, an organization's um, strategy, its business model, its use of and effects on the capitals, so those who take the exercise quite um, seriously are better informing the readers of their reports as to um, you know, how the organization creates or preserves or erodes value. Um, and this thinking, this more sort of connected thinking, is actually also paying dividends for the organization um, itself, figuratively speaking, <laughs> paying dividends for the organization itself in terms of decision making. Um, are there others that are not necessarily sort of living up to those requirements? Yes, and I think that we find this in any uh, form of reporting, but we see our view, you know, our role at the IRC uh, is to continue to nurture the development and to continue to encourage um, organizations along the path of integrated reporting, not in terms of the number of organizations adopting integrated reporting, but the quality of the outputs, their, their integrated reports. So thank you for that, uh, that question. I do see there's a number of other questions. Uh, we also have a question on okay. why do you think there was such a low level of responses to the topic papers from North America and what can we learn from this? Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting um, question. Um, there is, I mean, North America has um, it almost equivalents, right? So 
uh, the MDNA, the management discussion and analysis, in a way is a similar vehicle to integrated reporting insofar as it provides context for a company's uh, performance and prospects. So there is a vehicle that organizations are well used to using and are quite familiar with. Um, that bodes well for integrated reporting. On the other hand, those who might not know too much about integrated reporting might think, ooh, is this something different? Is this something new that I need to learn? And so we are at different levels of awareness about what integrated reporting is, depending on where you are around the world. So we are seeing some relatively low uh, responses from, from North America. That said, I am very encouraged. The more conversations I have and the quality of responses that came through from North America um, tells me that we are, uh, though we're at the early stages um, in, in uh, certainly the Canadian and um, American markets, the U.S. market, um, I do see that we are beginning to make some, some stronger headway. And, and we have a great uh, group, um, the U.S. integrated reporting uh, community in the U.S., that it has quite a lot of traction there as well. So again, I'm very encouraged. Thank you, Lisa. And I'm going to wrap two questions together because I think they're connected. Uh, the question is, how do we get engaged with the 90 day consultation and what's happening with the round, ta round tables during the comment period? Yeah, so there, there are a few ways to get engaged. You're, you're following one of those ways right now <laughs> by engaging here. Um, so thank you for taking the time out to do that. Um, we are offering um, virtual roundtables around the world. We have um, over 20 of those planned and we um, continue to receive offers to host regional roundtables. So very briefly, the model is that the IRC provides the, uh, like a toolkit for running these regional roundtables, uh, again, held virtually, um, and hosts, external hosts run those. So we would invite anyone, those on, on the call today, but, but anyone in, in the public to check out our website, um, which lists the various um, opportunities to be involved in roundtables. You can contact us if you're interested in hosting a roundtable, or if there's one that you're interested in participating in, also contact us. We will play matchmaker. We will uh, join you uh, up to the host of the, of the session. So that's another way to be involved. And then the third way to be involved is independently. You know, um, it's one thing to have a broad discussion uh, coming out of a roundtable event, but yet another mechanism is to make your voice heard as an individual uh, through our online survey. Thank you, Lisa. We've had a, a couple of other questions, but would you like to, uh, to move on and we can come back to those at the next Q&A pause? I probably think that would be wise, yes, just so that we don't run out of time, but um, we will revisit these questions at, at toward the end of the session. Right, so if we could move on, um, thank you. So the second phase of the revision project um, was the focused engagement period. So as I mentioned, this was over a 30 day uh, period, or if I didn't mention, uh, this was between February 20th and March 20th. And we structured that focused engagement around three specific topics, which are uh, shown in these three topic papers. Um, so the first two topic papers relate to the current um, integrated reporting framework revision process. So topic paper one addressed the responsibility for an integrated report and topic paper two addressed business model considerations. And the third topic paper explored themes um, that will shape the future of corporate reporting broadly. Um, so things like uh, assurance um, and the role of technology, those affect broader corporate reporting. But then we also had a few specific questions uh, in relation to integrated reporting um, more narrowly. So feedback on topic paper three will largely inform the IRC's longer term strategy and are not directly related to the current revision process. Next slide, please. So this slide summarizes the responses received in relation to the three topic papers. Um, it is uh, small and we are not gonna dive into the, the weeds of the actual numbers, but suffice it to say, we received 101 responses uh, to topic paper one. We received 104 responses to topic paper two and 90 for topic paper three. 
And interestingly, there was actually um, a mix across those topic papers. So some chose to dive in and just address one topic paper. Others picked two and still others um, responded to all three topic papers. Um, so um, this slide also breaks down the responses by stakeholder group and region for the three papers. Um, consultants, report preparers, professional bodies and academia represented the highest number of responses with investors unfortunately being the most underrepresented. Um, so we did have some responses from that segment of the market, but we will definitely need to target this group during the 90 day consultation period. Um, looking at the responses from a regional perspective, Europe did lead the way, but actually all geographic regions were well represented. So we were quite satisfied uh, with that. So before we consider the topic papers in more detail, we do want to explain how feedback from those topic papers was considered um, as the consultation draft for a revised framework was developed. So during the course of its work, our independent framework panel balanced multiple considerations, which are shown here. So they took into account the remit and objectives of the framework panel per its uh, terms of reference. They took into account the IRC's vision and mission as well as the goals of the framework revision project itself. Um, the framework panel also took into account the need to uphold the integrated uh, reporting frameworks principles-based approach. Um, it also took into account market views as received during the 30-day focused engagement period. And finally, took into account observed practice in integrated reporting. And you'll see how, how relevant that comes up in, in some of the slides that will follow. So the framework panel was um, also mindful that certain um, clarifications may be better placed outside of the framework itself in the form of supplementary uh, implementation guidance or other tools and resources, including, for example, our, our FAQs. Um, in April 2020, the framework panel consulted the IRC board um, and the IRC's council on its set of recommendations. And in May, the IRC board approved the consultation draft and the launch of the 90-day consultation period. So again, just some process uh, behind what we're going to hear about in the coming slides. So the consultation materials, um, which I'm going to be referring to throughout the rest of this session, are presented in two documents. So the first of those documents is the consultation draft itself. Um, it lists the consultation questions. So we have 15, uh, well, 14 targeted questions and one open question that accompany the, the consultation draft. Um, and the consultation draft shows all changes highlighted. So you, you can dip in and you can quickly see by the, um, you know, the, the very bright yellow where we've made some adjustments. Now, some of these adjustments are simply uh, to conform to our post 2013 branding guidelines. So they're, you know, more um, form over substance, <laughs> but you will also find some, uh, you know, all of the other revisions uh, that are more substantive um, also highlighted. So the second document is a companion document and that's divided into three parts. So part one captures the framework panel recommendations and the detailed proposals through sort of a before and after look. Part two includes a basis for conclusions, which provides the rationale for each of the classes of changes that you'll see in the consultation draft. And part three contains the summarized feedback from focused engagement on topic papers uh, one, two, and three. So the, the raw data, the raw feedback and detailed comments received from the public will also be made available on our website um, this week per our procedures handbook, um, just all part of our sort of standard due process. So the consultation features 15 questions, as I mentioned, and it's structured along three lines. The first is testing a set of revisions to the framework based on feedback to topic papers one and two. The second line is exploring longer term strategic themes that were probed in topic paper three. 
And finally, as I mentioned, there's this open feedback question where market views are invited on any topic that, that aren't, uh, any topic that's not already covered in, in those first two sections. And of course, we have some very key, important logistical information at the bottom of this slide in terms of length of the consultation, 90 days, the deadline for submissions, and how you can respond. Um, and I will sort of underscore a point that is made in the consultation draft and the companion document. We are only um, accepting responses through that online um, survey. Um, so if there are um, long PDF letters or individual emails, unfortunately, those responses will not be um, processed by our framework panel. So the way to, to be heard is through that online survey. Okay, so this slide shows the subject matter of the various consultation questions and how they align to the three topic papers and the feedback received. I keep harping on about <laughs> the tie back to the topic papers. I, I think it is important, you know, for any of you who have taken the time out to respond to these topic papers, you need to know that you've actually been heard. And so that's why we do find it quite important to, to uh, sort of explicitly link the focused engagement, which was 30 days on these topic papers, and then what we're testing with, with the market over a longer period. So that's what this slide is, is essentially doing. Um, in relation to topic paper three, some of the questions raised on subjects such as the purpose of an integrated report, as well as technology, uh, they are featured in the consultation draft. But again, these lie outside of the scope of the current revision. But we think that they warrant some additional uh, market attention and market feedback. Um, and we're also asking for market perspectives on other subjects, uh, including integrated thinking, uh, and other external uh, reporting standards and frameworks, simply because these are such recurrent themes uh, that we wanted to uh, discuss those as well and take this opportunity because we know that there's survey fatigue. So we're trying to sort of bundle our set of questions um, during this framework revision process. So I will pause there. We can take a few more questions. Thanks, Lisa. Um, that, that you're certainly not uh, generating any question fatigue uh, with your, <laughs> your overview. Uh, so I'm going to try and group them. They're coming in thick and fast. Um, so I, the first one is um, around whether the level of engagement uh, has been as expected so far and what's being done to ensure the next le level of engagement is representative across the areas. I'm assuming this refers to uh, the engagement with, with the um, IR framework revision process itself. Yeah, I, actually, I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised um, at the level of engagement that we received to what is a 30-day comment period during, I would say, a very tumultuous period. So we received 295 responses, uh, actually 297, if you um, <laughs> slipped through, through um, at the 11th hour. Um, but to have some 300 responses in such a narrow window um, during these unprecedented times. I'm actually very, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, we hope to continue to see that level of engagement. Um, and so here's my plug, anyone out there, if you can um, you know, sort of um, continue to sort of promote this amongst your networks, that would be uh, helpful indeed. And I'm going to, thank you, Lisa, I'm going to combine two questions which are of a similar ilk. Um, so the question is, how engaged is the IIRC with the many different initiatives currently trying to set standards for reporting, so environmental, social and governance, for example, the non-financial reporting directive within the EU, uh, taxonomy, FRAG's task force, the Value Balancing Alliance, and I'm going to add into that um, the recent um, World Economic Forum IBC paper uh, on Towards Common Metrics, which has proposed uh, a set of two dozen or so common metrics that they would uh, are advocating should be adopted across all industries. Okay, so I mean, I'm happy to uh, address some of those points, Jeremy. You might actually be interested in chiming in as well, but I'll I'll just quickly run through. I mean, we have a history of remaining engaged with um, all of these significant standards and frameworks you know, right from the start. If you if you took a look and continue to take a look at our the composition of our council. Uh, we have made sure that we, um, though we may have different um, instruments or vehicles or mechanisms, that we are all on the same bigger page. 
So um, as sort of a testament to that, in 2014, we developed the Corporate Reporting Dialogue, which brought together eight of the most um, influential standard setters and, um, and framework developers for corporate reporting. And we brought those around the same table. Um, and we continue to meet regularly. Um, we are um, very, very close to uh, many of the standards and frameworks and initiatives that have already been mentioned. We have, for example, I don't know, I can't remember if TCFD was mentioned amongst that long list, but as the uh, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures was developing its final um, set of recommendations, we provided input twice into that. Uh, we provide, uh, we are responding and have responded to the EU work on uh, the non-financial uh, reporting directive. Uh, as for WEF, and um, I'm beginning to forget some of the others that were in the list, but suffice it to say, it's, it's not only that we feel we need to and must stay connected, we want to. This is what we live and breathe. <laughs> this is what we enjoy. So we are very um, connected. Um, Jeremy, I don't know if you have anything else to, to offer. Um, so specifically on the, the, WEF, initi the WEF initiative, um, we are very supportive. Uh, of the ambitions of the the WEF initiative to, uh, to to have this two dozen or so common metrics that are reported consistently across um, uh, in the first instance the members of, of the International Business Council. Um, we also are of the view that metrics in the absence of a comprehensive reporting framework um, don't have the context that gives those metrics meaning. So if one allies um, the reporting metrics across those three different areas, environmental, social and governance, with a comprehensive reporting framework that sets the, the metrics within the context of the bigger strategic picture, particularly around value creation, value creation uh, across financial capital and the other five capitals of the IR framework, then it's a very much more powerful um, mechanism. And in our view also is of, of um, uh, a better decision grade um, for those metrics. So I, I think that's probably the, the summary of our position. Um, so Lisa, just two more questions uh, and then I uh, su suggest you, you might want to, to move on. Um, they relate specific to specific countries. We've had a question around uh, India um, and the, the role we may play or the ambitions we may have in India, particularly given the fact uh, that interest reporting is still um, voluntary um, and then we have a, a question from Fernando in Brazil to say how can we help spread um, the international IR revision uh, here in Brazil okay so Fernando hello we will you and I will talk because <laughs> I'm very very connected to the uh, the Brazilian Commission on integrated reporting and so I'm happy for us to take this offline to get into some specifics um, but I thank you for the enthusiasm and I thank you for the offer. So um, there, there will be, you know, just as a, the most, at the most basic level, there will be a, a virtual roundtable, a focus group in, in Brazil. Um, but as I say, let's, let's take that one offline um, just in the interest of time. Uh, the other question, India, plans for India. So there too, there's a round table that is planned. Um, I can either direct you to um, our website to take a look at some of the details of the when and the where, the, uh, you know, the hosts of the um, India-based round table. Um, so in the first instance, that, that's a great starting point uh, in terms of being engaged and, and hearing from this uh, market uh, directly. You know, in the past, we have had Sakandis who have been based in India. Uh, we um, are very close to India. So um, your interest is also my interest in terms of, um, of how things progress and develop in, in India. And we've seen some great uh, progress already made there. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, we'll pick up any further questions a bit later on. Perfect. So moving on to the next slide, please. Right, okay, so I think this is self-explanatory. We're gonna dive into some of the focused engagement feedback and how this weighs in or factors into the, uh, the consultation period. Um, so the first uh, topic paper focused on the responsibility for an integrated report by those charged with governance. Uh, and in particular, focused on section 1G of the framework. Now, this 
element or this aspect of, of integrated reporting, it was originally introduced to try to embed a sense of ownership or accountability for the integrated report at the very top of the organization. Uh, it was also introduced to uh, instill confidence in the integrated report and to build trust among users of the integrated report. And when we tested this logic back in 2013, the market agreed uh, very much so about those motivating factors, those driving factors. So that's one side of the equation. Users want this added level of quote unquote security uh, because they feel it lends credibility to the report. But on the other side of the equation, many preparers of integrated reports are uncomfortable providing such a statement um, based on the list of considerations shown on the right side of this slide. So these considerations include uh, you know, real or perceived conflicts with local regulations, uh, concerns over director liability, and confusion over certain terminology within Section 1G. And again, there are others on the list, but we needn't, uh, I think I've made the point here. So um, this continued disparity between what users want and what preparers are willing to provide was enough for us to retest that 2013 logic. So topic paper one raised five questions, which are shown uh, in condensed form here. And I'm not gonna go through them one by one, but rather I just um, you know, wanna highlight the key themes um, on, on which um, feedback uh, was provided. Uh, so they focus on um, process related disclosures in relation to uh, report preparation, including systems, procedures, and controls, as well as key roles and responsibilities of those involved in report preparation and report presentation. Um, the IRC also probed the merits of a statement of responsibility on a voluntary basis, um, and it also, um, and finally, a, a possible need to clarify the term, those charged with governance. So those are some of the key themes that this topic paper uh, probed. So in reviewing the feedback to topic paper one, our framework panel developed the following set of recommendations. So first, the framework should maintain the statement of responsibility in paragraph 1.20, but it should look to simplify that statement by first, uh, removing the required commentary on the application of a collective mind, Second, eliminating the need to comment on plans for a future statement of responsibility. And third, clarifying that full framework adherence is not a prerequisite for applying paragraph 1.20. So let me break that one down very quickly. If you're a new um, framework adopter and you're in your first and second year, you don't have to have a perfect integrated report to provide this statement from those charged with governance. You know, so perfection is not the precursor or the prerequisite for following this, um, this, this requirement. So the integrated reporting framework should encourage uh, process-oriented disclosures as either a supplement to a statement of responsibility or as a recommended alternative to such a statement where legal or regulatory requirements uh, present a particular concern or challenge in providing that statement. And finally, the framework should clarify the scope of the term, those charged with governance. Boy, that was a very uh, frequently asked question in terms of who's included in that, in that term. So the set of recommendations that you see on this slide, um, they try to find that balance between recognizing the needs and interests of those who use integrated reports and acknowledging some of the barriers or concerns among those who prepare integrated reports. Um, so we are sort of trying to find that, that comfortable middle ground. Um, and we go into more detail about all of this in the consultation drafts companion document. But for now, moving on. So we're moving on to topic paper two, which um, uh, focuses on business model uh, considerations. So why did we re-engage the market on this topic of all topics? So the first reason was continued confusion um, between the concepts of outputs and outcomes. So I often use this sort of simple example. If you're an automotive manufacturer, your output is the car and your outcomes will include things like enhanced mobility and convenience for customers, uh, increased air emissions, higher fossil fuel depletion, assuming we're not talking about electric vehicles here, 
So, you know, there, there's quite a distinction between the output and the outcomes. Um, but a review of integrated reports a few years ago showed that many, not all, but many, um, overlooked outcomes in their integrated reports. And as one respondent to a 2017 consultation that we, that we ran uh, observed, they said that by omitting outcomes, integrated reports rather miss the mark. And so the second concern that's shown on this slide relates to this missing the mark point. You know, so if report preparers fail to identify outcomes, then basically they fail to equip readers with the information needed to decide whether value overall is created, preserved, or eroded. Now, the third concern relates to imbalanced reporting. So for those who do discuss outcomes in their reports, um, they sometimes tend to showcase only the good news and overlook their negative outcomes and trade-offs. And that is very problematic. And finally, some believe that the framework covers impacts to direct stakeholders only, like customers and employees and investors, but that it overlooks the wider and often longer uh, term impacts on indirect stakeholders, including, for example, broader society and, and the natural environment. Um, so this simply uh, isn't the case, actually, as the framework's definition of outcomes actually does incorporate longer term impacts on society, the natural environment and others. So though it may not use the I word, um, it actually its coverage um, does does encompass these broader, uh, longer term and oftentimes indirect uh, effects. So we did see a need to, to address the coverage of impacts more explicitly in the framework. A second proposal addresses um, the outputs versus outcomes confusion. And there are several ways to go about this, including uh, making a simple tweak to the framework's value creation diagram. And we will get to this in, in but a moment. Um, so whereas the original value creation diagram included all four components, um, inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes in, in one single solid block, it might help to clearly distinguish between the mechanics of the business model, so what goes in, what's done, and what comes out, and the results of that, um, of that mechanism. Next slide, please. So um, this is just sort of a very simple <laughs> um, you know, visual, not trick, but technique. Um, that we hope that people, uh, report preparers, will take into account um, to better distinguish between the output, you know, going back to my earlier example, the car, and the outcomes, so the effects of that car um, um, to, on, on the capitals. Um, okay, move to the next slide, please. So, uh, topic paper two raised uh, four key questions for the market which are shown here. So basically, should examples and visual techniques elevate the importance of outcomes? Should outcomes and value creation be linked more explicitly through an example? Should the importance of balanced reporting be reinforced more strongly within the framework? And finally, should the framework clarify its coverage of impacts uh, on society and, and uh, the natural environment? So there was overwhelming support for all of those proposals that were put forth in topic paper two. And in reviewing this feedback, the framework panel developed the following set of recommendations. So firstly, the framework can encourage stronger business model reporting by clarifying the distinction between uh, outputs and outcomes using an example by elevating the importance of outcomes by linking more explicitly to value creation, value preservation, or value erosion, by promoting greater balance in the reporting of outcomes, and by clarifying the framework's coverage of wider impacts under the existing term outcomes. So again, in establishing these recommendations, the framework panel considered a range of factors, including the market feedback, um, but also considering some of the interpretive challenges within the existing framework text and also taking into account observed market practice. So moving on, let's take a look at how these proposals actually play out in the consultation draft. This is a busy slide, I respect that, um, but um, we're going to try to navigate our, our way around this. So 
Um, we distinguish outputs from outcomes by reminding report preparers of the definition of outcomes right where they need to see that definition in paragraph 4.19. So previously, framework users um, needed to dig back to the glossary section to, to sort of refresh or be, get oriented to the concept of outcomes. So this new addition is highlighted in the opening paragraph um, of the excerpt on the right. We also include a simple example as shown in the second column um, of the excerpt. And again, this works to distinguish outputs from outcomes. And then next we address the issue of imbalanced reporting of outcomes uh, at the very end of this excerpt by referencing the importance of using uh, both qualitative and quantitative information to explain outcomes. So this places greater emphasis on evidence-based disclosures rather than you know, empty or baseless claims about an organization's effects on the capitals. So uh, we see here, there are two consultation questions that relate to the proposed revisions for paragraph 4.19. And we're very keen to hear your early views, um, recognizing that you are seeing this for the first time right now. Um, but uh, we are interested to know, you know, do you think we are moving in the right direction with some of these steps, albeit simple steps, are we moving in, in the right direction? So question six in the consultation draft asks, does paragraph 4.19 sufficiently differentiate outputs from outcomes? Um, and so we pointed to two of the uh, affected um, revisions. And question eight asks, does the final sentence in paragraph 4.19 sufficiently encourage evidence-based reporting of outcomes. So I'll pause there, give you a few moments to digest. Uh, and again, if you'd like to respond either by using the chat function, well, I, that might be the best way, Jeremy, I don't know about you, but um, some way to be heard, to chime in. Uh, we'd love to hear your knee-jerk reactions. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we, we've had a number of questions. I'll start with one which um, is fairly specific to the EU. Um, and it relates to the uh, EU's non-financial reporting directive, which uh, I'm sure everybody is aware uh, is going through a revision uh, process of its own um, currently, um, and has been mandatory for some years now for all uh, EU member states to uh, adopt as law. Um, so the question is uh, how we expect the IIRC uh, to engage with the uh, EU around the, uh, the non-financial reporting um, uh, directive. Uh, and the potential role of FRAG um, in uh, whatever might come out of the other end of the consultation process for the for the non-financial reporting directive itself. Okay, um, so I can offer a response. It's not going to be a very deep response because actually um, I am not overseeing that effort. Our policy team is overseeing that effort. Um, that said, I have in the past, throughout the the earlier developments um, of the non-financial reporting directive, weighed into the technical points and look for points of alignment. So um, I can attest to the fact that we are engaged um, and um, have or will shortly be um, submitting a response um, to, to the current process. Um, beyond that, I, I, you know, I can't get into any more detail because I'm afraid I don't have more detail <laughs> than that, that sort of level of response. Thanks, Lisa. And then we've had um, some very interesting comments coming through. Um, the first relates uh, to the to the ESG uh, that we were talking about earlier um, in the context of the, the WEF uh, report and the ESG metrics. Um, and a comment uh, along the lines that um, uh, environmental and social aspects of ESG really relate to performance, whereas the governance is the underlying um, institutional arrangements in place uh, to, to help manage and govern uh, a company. Um, do you want to share any reflections on that in the context of the IR framework review? Because uh, I know that uh, governance is, is a core part of what's being looked at. Yeah, I'm uh, Peter. I'm enjoying your your comments here and and um, your love of the exclamation point. Um, so yes, I have the same feeling about ESG bothering bothering you and me. Um, I feel the same, and I'd be surprised if I've actually used that uh, that acronym at all today. Um, I don't love it myself. Um, I am happy that um, the framework covers the same ground, but does so using some slightly different terminology. Um, you know, the E part would be covered under natural capital. 
Uh, the social part would be a, a combination of the uh, social and relationship capital when we're talking about strategic relationships and brand and reputation, but also from the human uh, capital side of things in terms of productivity, training, uh, turnover, things like that would be covered under human capital. So I tend to stick with the language of the capitals, but I recognize that it's, um, it, it's everyone's choice as to what terminology they, they prefer themselves. The governance piece, I do uh, agree um, that I think it's helpful for that to be carved out on its own because oftentimes when it is bundled with the E and the S, um, I, I tend to think that the G is overlooked and I think that that might be what your point is here. So I don't disagree with that. Um, it's why we have that carved out as um, a particular um, element of the integrated report. Um, and in particular, it's important not just to provide that sort of basic vanilla information as to who sits on your board and what are their terms of expiry. I think it's very important to spell out those lines of accountability um, and to uh, the, the connection to strategy development, uh, to understanding the legitimate needs and interests of the stakeholder groups that are um, that affect or could be affected by the organization. And I guess bundling that up with a, a tidy bow, um, I think it's important for the report to indicate how the governance bodies or how governance links in to value creation or as the case may be value preservation or erosion. So um, I, I think slash hope we're talking about the same thing here, but I, I see your concerns and uh, I certainly don't disagree with those concerns. Thanks, Lisa. And we have a follow-up question or comment from, from Peter, which I think picks up on that. Um, it, essentially, one can summarise it as, as integrated reporting uh, for whom? Uh, again, I know this is an area you've been looking at, but uh, following the revision, is an integrated report still primarily for providers of financial capital and other stakeholders, or is there likely to be some discussion around that? So it, it is a topic that we raised in topic paper three. Um, it is re-raised in, uh, in the consultation draft, so we're not done with that conversation. <laughs> you know, since the day the framework was developed, um, people were quite divided. Um, I, in terms of the direction that we will go, I, I, I don't know. As, you, as I said earlier, we are market-led. We, we do, um, that's why we consult on this and, and will be consulting on this twice this year. Um, I think that there's actually a decent balance right now, but I can actually also see some merits in some of the, the proposals uh, that some put forward. You know, we talk of six capitals um, and, and yet paragraph 1.7 would appear to, it doesn't intend to, but it would appear to put one capital ahead of the others. So um, we have explored, uh, should we sort of be knocking that word financial out of that paragraph so that it is the providers of all forms of capital? Yes, I recognize that natural capital isn't provided by a, a group of people, but hopefully we, we understand the underlying intent there that all six forms of capital uh, play a role. And, and so I think that there are some good proposals that are out there. I, I don't know what direction we'll go in. In this current revision, it was far too divided for us to make a decision um, either way, uh, because there are some who recognize that the investor community through its allocation decisions has a huge role to play here. It doesn't mean they're more important, uh, but they, they play a huge role then they have a huge influence and some are concerned if we open up the, um, the audience or the purpose to everyone, what is that going to do? Is there a risk of, of diminishing the importance or the significance of integrated reporting amongst that community? I don't have an opinion on this. I'm just relaying some of the feedback that we've heard. So if you feel strongly, Peter, please do reply and, and get those around you to, uh, to not to apply, to, to submit um, your responses. Thank you, Lisa. And we've had an, a, an offer of support from Hugo in Colombia. Uh, who has uh, said, how can, how can I help support uh, the IIRC's activities? I suggest that we pick up uh, offline with, with Hugo. Yeah, perfect. Um, so uh, I, I don't know uh, if you have my email address, but uh, if you could contact, um, I assume, Jeremy, your email address is out there with everyone. If, if responses could be funneled through you and, and then sent to me, uh, that yeah. would be perfect. And thank you, Hugo. 
Okay, Lisa, I suggest you move on. Right. Oh boy, I was enjoying that. Um, so where, yes, thank you, Katrina. Um, okay, so uh, I think where we left off uh, before the questions, feedback to the focused engagement period, the 30 days overwhelmingly supported uh, the need for clearer distinction between outputs and outcomes. Quite frankly, I would be surprised if anyone said, <laughs> no, it's too well-defined. So we had, you know, somewhere in the 90% uh, saying, yes, absolutely, um, distinguish those concepts, please make them much clearer. So figure two uses uh, visual techniques to distinguish between outputs and outcomes and the link uh, between outcomes to value preservation, uh, well, value creation, preservation or erosion. Uh, so we're going to pause one more time here to sort of kick the tires on this diagram. What we've done here, you'll see in that sort of center box, the business model piece, we've tried to separate more clearly um, outputs from outcomes. Uh, because if a company or an organization is not addressing its outcomes, it's only talking about what it makes or what it does. Uh, then they are missing the boat. And so we've tried to carve that out as, uh, as quite distinct using color coding and an actual physical barrier between the two. And yet all four elements continue to be part of the business model. We're just really looking to divide the mechanics of that business model from the results of that business model, because that's key to value creation uh, ultimately. So that's one of the tweaks we've made. Um, and we've also, um, I should say, this is a mock-up, um, so things will uh, change and improve. This is uh, very much my amateur efforts here. Um, but we've also tried to make a better link between outcomes and the effects on the right-hand side of that diagram, the effects on the capitals. So through color coding, again, we've tried to bridge those more um, uh, you know, uh, explicitly. Okay, so question seven asks, does figure two sufficiently distinguish outputs from outcomes and link outcomes to value creation, preservation, or erosion? Again, happy to pause there, get some knee-jerk reactions. Uh, yes, no, needs work. There's nothing uh, coming in on the chat function right now, Lisa. Okay. Um, I'll give it 10 seconds and then I uh, will move on. Right, I think we're probably safe to, to move on. Okay, so um, we conducted a, a review of randomly selected integrated reports back in 2016. So again, that's you know, three, four years uh, ago. Um, but we found that uh, in a quarter of those randomly selected reports, negative outcomes tended to get overlooked. Probably no big surprises amongst this audience, <laughs> but it, you know, we have some statistics behind it. So 25% overlooked uh, negative outcomes. Um, they amplified positive results and they used promotional language to cast outcomes in a more favorable light. So in response, the consultation draft works to address that inherent bias in the term value creation by reminding framework users of the potential for value preservation or erosion. Now, the original framework made this clarification, but from what we're seeing, um, we're wondering if, hmm, did it make that point frequently enough? And so that's why you will see a number of instances uh, throughout the framework now. I can't remember how many exactly, um, it was somewhere between, I don't know, 10 and 15 additional references where where we say value creation, we do insert the words preservation or erosion to remind report preparers of the need for, for balance. Um, so this brings us to question uh, number nine. Do you think that putting the increased emphasis on value preservation and value erosion um, is a helpful uh, step? Will, will that encourage more balanced reporting of outcomes? Now I could ask that rhetorically or we could move on. I am seeing the time and thinking we ought to move on. Thanks, Katrina. So, um, and now looking at impacts in particular, and I think I saw impacts in some of the questions. Um, so market feedback has encouraged a clarification of the framework's coverage of impacts, um, you know, often linked to 
the natural environment or society at large, impacts generally refer to an organization's positive or negative effects, whether they're direct or indirect, and whether they're near-term or long-term in nature. And in response, the consultation draft inserts a clarifying statement to paragraph 4.20. And the statement reads, by addressing positive and negative effects across the capitals, as well as short, medium, and long-term consequences for direct stakeholders and society at large, an integrated report enables users to evaluate the organization's wider impacts. So what we're doing here is making that connection through one sentence, trying to make that connection that outcomes where actually cover impacts. I know that some are precious about these words. And so we were very cautious about, uh, do we introduce this additional term? Do we talk of outcomes and do we talk of impacts? we heard quite loudly and clearly uh, through some of the feedback that no please don't add more don't clutter the, the the framework with more definitions so we're trying to walk that fine line to acknowledge that impacts are covered but avoiding uh muddying the waters by using two terms that are for all intents and purposes the same so we'll move on to the next slide Finally, we come to topic paper three. This was a sort of catch-all for all longer-term considerations for both the framework and for the IRC strategy. Uh, and whereas topic papers one and two probed matters related to the current framework revision, topic paper three maintained a longer-term strategic view. So to that question that was asked earlier, it probed the possible clarification of the purpose of the integrated report. Um, some think the framework's purpose section puts investors first and ranks financial capital above all other forms of capital. And as I mentioned, although that, was, that is not the framework's intent, uh, in studying paragraphs 1.7 and 1.8 quite carefully, it's a reasonable and understandable interpretation by some in the marketplace. So we do hear that concern. Um, topic paper three also posed questions on how technology and assurance will feature into the future of integrated reporting. Um, and just in the interest of time, I think we'll move on to the next slide, please, Katrina. So the question from topic paper three covering the purpose of an integrated report uh, has been included in the current consultation. Uh, and again, although this issue lies beyond the scope of the current framework revision, uh, the strength and the quality of arguments received from the focused engagement do warrant further market feedback um, on this issue. Um, I think we'll move on to the next slide. And again, there is a part two to this. So paragraphs 1.7 and, and 1.8 uh, kind of go hand in hand. Um, again, looking at the clock, I would invite uh, you know, those who are interested to, to visit the consultation draft and the companion document to see uh, the proposals that are put forth in the consultation draft. Um, and again, the, yeah, the next slide um, weighs these pros and cons of, um, uh, of, the, of the need to, to revisit the purpose and audience for integrated reporting. Thankfully, that earlier question that was raised, I've covered all of this by, by addressing that, sort of the pros and cons. Um, the investor community has uh, considerable influence through its allocation decisions, um, so it's an important mechanism but by the same token, there are four, uh, sorry, there are six uh, forms of capital that need uh, sort of equal attention here. Um, next slide, please. Um, so actually, <laughs> here's an opportunity for uh, further questions. If there are any final questions, I see we're down to one minute here. Um, but again, I just want to reiterate ways that you can um, help promote the consultation draft for the IRC. So, you know, in addition to making your own submission, which to me is the number one uh, favored thing that you can do, but you can also, uh, you know, link to the consultation draft on your website if you're from an organization or uh, an industry body or in your LinkedIn profile. You can include an article if you have uh, newsletters, for example. Uh, and you can leverage your media network. So if there are any ways that you can promote this within your networks, it is important that we hear from a, a wide cross-section of, of market participants. You know, I mean this regionally, I mean this in terms of industry, uh, stakeholder group, 
Uh, so you'd really be helping us in that way. So I'm going to stop there. We've reached, <laughs> we've reached the top of the hour. So I will stop there and hand back to you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, well done. Uh, you, you've spoken, as Liz did this morning, for almost an hour uh, without a break and fielded lots of questions. So uh, uh, well done indeed, and thank you very much um, for providing such a comprehensive overview uh, of the, the IR framework revision process. Um, if we just move on um, to the final slide, uh, and then I'll wrap up. Um, just a quick plug, um, on 30th of November and the 1st of December is our global conference. It will be hosted in Frankfurt in Germany. Uh, we'll be live streaming it for those who uh, would like to attend but, but would prefer not to or cannot travel. Um, and if social distancing in the autumn means that we cannot uh, hold the event face to face, then we will live stream it across these two days. It will be, as ever, a fantastic event, uh, an opportunity to network with your peers, uh, the, uh, and hear from experts, the, the theme is sustainable value creation in an interconnected world. Um, and we hope you will deepen your understanding uh, of how integrated thinking enables business model resilience and adaptability for your organization in times of crisis, uh, which is extremely topical uh, with uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis that the world has been going through and is still going through. Um, so, Lisa, thank you once again uh, for uh, your excellent overview. Thank you, everybody who has contributed questions. Many thanks to those who've offered support. We'll follow up uh, separately with you and work out how we could work with you to help uh, um, increase uh, awareness and uptake and adoption of integrated reporting uh, in your countries. And I wish all of you uh, a very good morning, a very good afternoon, a very good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Many thanks. <laughs>